As more news on 3news.com, make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Alban Sumana Kinsford Bagbing, fails in his attempt to set aside the Supreme Court's orders suspending his ruling, which declared four parliamentary seats vacant. We were in court earlier today. We'll tell you how the courts dismissed the Speaker's application and, in fact, a number of reactions that have greeted the, the decision by the Supreme Court earlier today. And let's put it on record that this is not the determination of the substantive matter before the court. The 11th of November is a date to watch. And we're going to get into all of that as we, we go on. But yeah, earlier today, the Supreme Court dismissed the, the application by the Speaker of Parliament seeking to set aside their ruling, uh, which asks Aban Bagwin to halt the execution of declaring the seats of the four members of Parliament vacant. You remember that ex parte application and then uh, the aftermath of it uh, almost two weeks ago. Now, the five-member panel presided over by the Chief Justice herself held that the Speaker's application amounted to misinformation and misapprehension of the law. That's their conclusion on this. But take a listen to the Chief Justice delivering her ruling earlier today. Take a look. I noted that the issue was the subject of constitutional disputes and not that of political parties. Chief Justice Gertrude Tokonu, presiding over the panel, indicated that they had within its ranks a former General Secretary of PNC and former NDC parliamentary candidate. Counsel for the leader of MPP caucus, Afenya Marking, was satisfied with the decision of the court. First defendant, that is the Speaker of Parliament, now has no excuse whatsoever to decline or fail to file his defense and statement of case to be action. So now we are poised for a full hearing and determination of the matter. No more interlocutory or interim applications. So lawyers of the Speaker of Parliament have been given up to November 6th to file all their processes and statement of issues that will be relied on. But the case itself has been adjourned to November 11, where the Supreme Court is expected to make its um, hearing and then eventually make its final judgment on the substantive matter on November 11. Lordi Rasari, TV3 News, Supreme Court. Well, so th that was just um, also a summary of what happened in court earlier today and the specific indication and also the references that the Chief Justice gave in coming to some conclusions is what has generated some questions and also reactions as to, as to whether really that satisfies or ticks the boxes um, with respect to the conversation that preceded today. But let's hear from the Chief Justice the specific reference she made and the law on which she dwelt on to deliver the ruling and the conclusion of that five-member panel earlier today. We have considered the application and find that the grounds supporting the application have no merit because of the very explicit and clear directions of the 1992 Constitution, specifically Article 2, Article 130, and Article 296 and established decisions of the Supreme Court from decades of the country's constitutional history. Exceptional circumstances that would flow from the effect of the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament declaring the four seats vacant and a determination not to allow the MPs to remain in Parliament. What are some of the effects that weighed on our minds as exceptional circumstances that were alluded to in the ruling? The four constituencies of Amenfi Central, Formina, Aguna West, and Suhum in the Western Region, Ashanti Region, Central Region, and Eastern Regions of Parliament are made up of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians who had queued to elect these members of parliament to represent their interests in parliament as their voices. By declaring that their duly elected representatives in parliament had vacated their seats for acts that were interpreted within the light 
of Article 971G by the Speaker. The Speaker was actually enforcing this interpretation of Article 971G against those hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians, and not just the four people that sit in Parliament. And in fact, this is uh, the matter that has generated some conversation right now. My colleague Dennis Barberi Wadam, um, Esquire, is going to be joining me. Um, he was in court earlier today, and we're going to set the basis and, and break it down into pieces every step of the way so that you understand uh, the, the layers of the Chief Justice's earlier, in fact, the, the panel of judges earlier ruling today on the Speaker's application and the conversation that has ensued as a result of this, the dismissal of that application by, by the Speaker of Parliament seeking to set aside that Supreme Court order to have him, his uh, that's a decision to declare these four seats vacant, unexecutable. Dennis is, is, is here. It's good to have you. Now, first question on the mind of people, really, why the Supreme Court rejected the Speaker's motion to, to set aside that October 18 orders. What was the issue? Well, so the court came to the conclusion that, I mean, having listened to the applicant, the speaker in this case, and listened to counsel for the majority leader, mm -hmm. Alexander Fanyo Makin, and that of the attorney general, the court came to the conclusion that the eight grounds on which the applicant mounted that particular um, um, suit or application, they have no merit. And they have no merit because they made reference to the constitutional provisions of Articles 2, Articles, Articles 2, 130, and then 296 of the 1992 Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, in explaining Article, Article 2, the court says that for the fact that the, the Article 2 establishes constitutional supremacy of the country, mm -hmm. what it means is that essentially if any person alleges that an act contravenes any provision of the Constitution, that person can invoke the original jurisdiction of the, of the Supreme Court for an order that will set aside that particular action. Right. In essence, the court came to the conclusion that, I mean, when you look at the grounds on which this suit was mounted or this application was mounted, mm -hmm. one, it was to the effect that the Supreme Court did not have the jurisdiction to hear the matter. Mm -hmm. So they based on Article 2 and then Article 130 to establish that indeed the court has that jurisdiction to hear. Right. Citing the, the, the explanation I just gave earlier. Mm -hmm. Again, there was also the question as to whether the, 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 the application itself was even proper before the court. True. I mean, that was by way of procedure, because the applicant makes the, uh, the argument that the manner in which that application came before the court was not proper. He also raises issues about service and all that. Mm -hmm. But let's look at what spe the, the specific issues that the court had to deal with. So on the question of jurisdiction, right. the court looked at Articles 2 and 130, and that's where it asserted that constitutional supremacy. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it is the only court that can interpret and enforce the Constitution. Right. And that is what they said they were doing in this particular instance. Mm. There was also a question of proper service. And remember that when it came to service, there was an issue of a certain circular. That was an agreement, supposed to be an agreement between the Chief Justice and the Speaker of Parliament as to when the Speaker can be served and members of Parliament in general mm -hmm. could be served. The speaker had to reject the court processes being served on him mm. because he had said that he and then the chief justice agreed that they could only be served on Monday. And to the, the fact that the service was not effective on Monday, the speaker wrote that the processes be sent back to the court. But then the court came to the conclusion that they are of the view that all the processes that were served on the speaker, they were in accordance with law and they were in accordance with administrative processes. I see. Yes, and, and, and yes, so, so there's, 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 there's the, that particular SOT where you hear the Chief Justice speak on how the, the service was appropriate with respect to the secular. Um, that was in contention as to whether the secular took precedence over the law or mm. all that. Let's listen to the, 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 the Chief Justice, then we'll put that into proper context. We have considered the objection to the procedure used to serve the speaker because of the administrative circular of the Supreme of the Chief Justice in 2021 and 2024. We are satisfied that administrative procedures cannot override the potency of legality.
and every procedure used by the Supreme Court to serve the processes of the Speaker of Parliament were actually in conformity with law and the circulars issued by the Chief Justices in 2021 and 2024. Uh, so, so that's the position of the Chief Justice yes. on this matter. Yes. So, in that fact, really she goes said. further to clarify, or the court clarified, that in that circular, the circular in question, mm -hmm. the agreement was that the Speaker can be served personally on Mondays, but that he could be served through the legal department on any other day. I see. And so, I... all that put together, that was how they came to the conclusion that the Speaker's interpretation of the circular, based on which he rejected the processes, was inappropriate, and the court was of the view that service was properly effected. I recall uh, the former director of the Ghana School of Law, Kwekwan Sasari, made the point that even serving the speaker through the legal department in his own considered view was a wrong approach. Well, uh, really, and, and so it's obviously contrary to what the, 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 the Supreme Court has concluded on today. Well, so that's, that's, that's what the Supreme Court says, mm -hmm. I mean, with respect to that. And they did not deny the fact that there was an existence of a, a circular. In fact, she even indicated that it existed before she came to, into office. Mm -hmm. And that when he, I mean, she came into office, there was, there was a second meeting or another meeting with the speaker. And then that particular circular was activated again. So it, it, exists. it exists. What's the question of the, of the issue of natural justice? I think that's another issue that came up as well. Yes, so the right? issue of natural justice came because of the ex-party motion. Mm -hmm. So it was the argument of the applicants, in this case the speaker, that for the fact that they were not heard and an order was granted to suspend his ruling, it was not fair in the interest of justice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they made reference to the rules of courts. The rules of courts are clear. The basic rule is that no ex-party motion should be accepted. However, there's an exception. So they made reference to the exceptions. What are and those? So the exception is that there has to be exceptional circumstances to warrant the hearing and grant of an ex parte motion. Mm. So the court was of the view that, having looked at the facts before them, they thought that there were exceptional circumstances. Then the court went on to list a number of them. The fact that four members of parliament had lost their seats by the speaker's ruling, and that they were not just there on their own accord, they represented some constituents, constituents, hundreds of them, according to the court, mm -hmm. they felt that it was not, it, that, that amounted to an exceptional circumstance that they needed to remedy. They make the point that this order came at the point where the speaker was in the known of a pending motion or a pending lawsuit that was challenging or seeking for an interpretation of the prohibition that he used to declare those seats vacant. I see. She also went on to, to talk about the fact that some of them were also playing other rules, like the second deputy speaker, which would also affect them. If some of them were ministers, likely they would have been affected and all that. The court came to the conclusion that those circumstances were exceptional in their nature, for which the grant of an ex parte motion was allowed under the rules. Let's hear from the Chief Justice on this, right? Yes, and yes, and that point that you, you made earlier, also espousing that in the process of reading the judgment today. Take a look. It, it can be seen from the very first page of the 1992 Constitution that the most fundamental and hallowed right of every Ghanaian that the 1992 Constitution gives and jealously guards is that when anyone, including the president and vice president, is embarking on an act on any act that violates any provision of the Constitution, or if anyone is of the considered opinion that any law or rule enacted by any legislative body breaches the Constitution, that person can run to the Supreme Court for enforcement of the Constitution. That person does not even need to be directly affected by that act or law. This Supreme Court regularly exercises this original and exclusive jurisdiction for citizens of this country. Exceptional circumstances that would flow from the effect of the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament declaring the four seats vacant and a determination 
not to allow the MPs to remain in Parliament. What are some of the effects that weighed on our minds as exceptional circumstances that were alluded to in the ruling? The four constituencies of Amenfi Central, Formina, Aguna West, and Suhum in the Western Region, Ashanti Region, Central Region, and Eastern Regions of Parliament are made up of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians who had queued to elect these members of parliament to represent their interests in parliament as their voices. By declaring that their duly elected representatives in parliament had vacated their seats for acts that were interpreted within the light of Article 971G by the speaker, the speaker was actually enforcing this interpretation of Article 971G against those hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians. And you hear the Chief Justice continuously talk about interpretation, interpretation by the Speaker. The Speaker was also, and in fact, those who are uh, aligned with that argument say he was consistent that he was not interpreting the Constitution, but as it were, uh, only communicating uh, the essence of violating Article 97 GNH. But the court was of the considered view that the speaker did actually interpret the constitution. Yes, by, by, and, and, by, by, and, by and, that not, and not just the speaker. The court was of the view that, considering what happened on the floor of parliament today, and even the parties before the court itself, they had different interpretations to what Article 97, 1 G and H actually meant. Okay. So clearly, there were different interpretations to it, and it is only the Supreme Court that has that jurisdiction to interpret and enforce the constitution. Uh, so the, it's even beyond the speaker. Even the mm, parties before the court itself, they were divided. On the matter of the indefinite adjournment, in fact, this particular case of the uh, court saying that until the final determination of the original case before yes, them, yes. This, this matter should, should still be... So held. that's actually one of the grounds that, uh, on which the applicants came to say that ordinarily ex party um, Ex party applications, or if you like, um, when an injunction is granted ex party, mm -hmm. it should last for 10 days and then it is repeated on notice. However, what we saw here was the Supreme Court granting an indefinite order for an ex party motion. That was the ground of the applicants. But the Supreme Court says that, yes, that is what ordinarily the rules would say. However, the applicant failed to appreciate that when the Supreme Court is sitting under Article 2, Mm -hmm. It looks at Articles 2.2, 2, 2, 2.3, and 2.4. Now, 2.2 2 simply says that when the Supreme Court is making a declaration, it can make such orders as it may consider appropriate for giving effect to such declarations. I see. So, in the view of the Supreme Court, this was the point where they used to go around the 10-day limit because they were sitting under this. Mm -hmm. And in their view, because they thought there were exceptional circumstances, exactly. they had to make orders that were appropriate or that they consider appropriate so as to be able to give effect to what they were doing. And what Interesting. If, so they also asked another question, that even if they were giving them 10 days, you know after they made the orders, they asked that they filed the processes within seven days. Mm -hmm. They said if all parties had filed the processes within seven days, they could have been able to deal with the matter, but by this week they would have ended with the matter. And it wouldn't have been more than the 10 days anyway. So that was the explanation they gave for the reason they had to give an indefinite order in respect of an ex party motion. In fact, because that was one of the contentious matters that an ex party motion is abnormal to, to have to be given an indefinite order. Yes, according order. to the rules of court. According to the rules of court. But they rely on days. the constitution. Well, uh, lawyer Martin Pebble and Dr. Rashid Oman are going to be joining us in a bit right now. But let's hear from the Chief Justice specifically talking about this matter of the indefinite that was um, applied in the case of this ex parte motion. And my, my two guests will be joining me right now. But take a look. Grants of orders beyond 10 days. The speaker's lawyer urges that because of order 25 rule 18 of the High Court Civil Procedure Rules 2004, CI 47, that enjoins high courts to grant injunctions and other preservation orders for 10 days in the first instance if heard as party and without notice to one party summoned before the court. The Supreme Court was also enjoined to grant the ex-party order for 10 days as a matter of rules and practice.
This is a submission that fails to appreciate the import of Article 2.2 and 2.3 and 2.4, which guide the Supreme Court when dealing with a constitutional matter such as this. And we have a conversation on this right now, considering a number of you have been reacting to this. Dr. Rashid Draman is Executive Director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Martin Pebo is also private legal practitioner, and one of the foremost human rights lawyers we have in this country. Uh, gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Mr. Kansi. Uh, and I'll start off with you, uh, Lawyer Martin Pebo, as an officer of the courts, and having followed this particular case quite closely, the outcome today of the Supreme Court, considering the Speaker's application, did that strike you differently from what the Supreme Court judges who sat on this case thought? Yes, uh, absolutely. Why is that? Absolutely. I... I was hopeful. I was hoping that uh, the speaker's application through his lawyer, Tado Sorry, was going to succeed, at least in part. At least in part. You see, uh, let's go cut to the chase, go to the main point. You see, the Supreme Court says, uh, looking at Article 2, they could make the order beyond 10 days. Let's say, I'm not persuaded. You see, Mr. Kansi. We are all lawyers. We and the Supreme Court judges. It's the same training we're given in law school. It's one universal exam. You don't write any extra exams apart from the law school exams to go to the Supreme Court. It's the same. It's the same thing. Every lawyer, even a lawyer who graduated uh, this in last week, you know, I've been mentioning Denis' example. Yes, the exams Denis wrote and passed to become a lawyer. That's it. If Denis is rising to the Supreme Court, sometimes High Court and Court of Appeals, a few exams here and there. But Supreme Court, nobody writes any exams to go to the Supreme Court. So it's the same text everybody is reading. I, from what I read, I don't think that is what Article 2 is saying. Because we have what we call settled practice. If you want to see that the practice is settled, even you check the proceedings of 18th October, the lawyer who applied, Park we see a baby. He himself told the court, is there, you can check, that he wants the order for 10 days because that is the settled practice. Settled. If the court is going to go uh, bring a new rule, it's not done in the fashion the Supreme Court did. Then they had to give very detailed reasons to persuade lawyers and other uh, persons interested in reading. But if you read the orders of the 18th of October, no detailed reasoning and persuasion was offered. So this today's resort to Article 2 is not persuasive at all. And the more the Supreme Court digs in its heels, the more it will lose us. Because you're losing lawyers. You're losing lawyers. And that shouldn't be. Because, you see, for us to say openly that we, don't, we disagree with the Supreme Court, it doesn't come lightly. you. So before you see a lawyer say, I disagree with the Supreme Court on X, Y, Z, then it tells you it's indefensible. Because when it's 50-50, people will just rather shut up because they say, well, it's a discretion. And you know, each person, it, it, the Supreme Court judge has the discretion and he exercises it that way. So, well, we may not make too much noise when it's 50-50. But this one is very settled, very, very, very settled, that if you go alone, that's one party and the lawyer, go alone to the court for an injunction, and in this case, and it applies to this day of execution, usually that order is for 10 days. Check the proceedings of 18th October and the orders and made on that day. The Supreme Court did not persuade anybody as to why it should, the order should last to the end of the case. And I believe today's resort to Article 2 is too late. It's just too little too late. The, the court is losing us. And you see the Afrobarometer uh, thing on uh, this and trust in the judiciary. You see it's coming down from 65% in 2012. The latest one says, what, 35%. So from 2012 to tw uh, 2024, about how many, 12 years on, the trust in the judiciary has been halved. So I thought that the court would be mindful of some of those things. And the way, you know, in recent times, 
Many people are talking. Many people are railing and railing. So I thought the court would have been mindful of that and seen how to handle this application so that at least Parliament's dignity is restored to a certain extent. But today, standing in court throughout the proceedings, I didn't get that at all. It's a disappointment. No, no. You see, the trust in the judiciary will go down and down because then quickly, right? you see even the matter of justice and as Garou was raised, that he was an MPP parliamentary candidate. Mm -hmm. That's also something they should have just well, removed. Well, well the Chief Justice's response to that was that this, this matter was a constitutional matter and not a political matter. And so uh, that the said judge being on the panel really w was immaterial to the concerns that uh, the Speaker's lawyer, uh, Tadio Sorry, had raised. Does that cut it oh, for you? I'm sure you... I'm sure once again, you know, I'm not persuaded. This this case, this case is as political as anything else. This, this is a case between NDC and MPP. Straight. No curve, no bend. This is a case between MPP and NDC. So when you have a justice who uh, is a member of the MPP, no, you don't empanel him. You don't empanel him. You see, the thing, you see, cut to the chase uh, is... Just come down to, well, I have the power and I have decided. That's where it is. But no, it should be persuasion with lots of authorities, okay? Reasoning that anybody reading it will say that, hmm, yeah, this one, I, I give up, I surrender. But that reason that was given, no, it doesn't go far at all. This case is MPP versus NDC. I'm saying so. That's the way I see this case. You can't just say because they've raised constitutional provisions, then it's not NDC and MPP. It's NDC versus MPP. Simple. Even lay people. When the Supreme Court said it, there were lay people in court who were whispering that, ah, but this one, they're not so outside. This one is MPP versus NDC. That's why I said, so you are left with a feeling that it just shows that, well, I have the power. I've decided. Yeah, you, at the end of the day, that's just what you were left with, but not superior legal reasoning. No, 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 no. I didn't see that. Well, Dr. No, Dr. No. Dr. Dr. Sidraman, uh, hold on a bit for me. Dr. Sidraman, I just want to bring you in. Uh, the, the Chief Justice, in fact, to, to uh, at least come to terms with the se sentiments of the people, at, at the ending of the proceedings today, she expressed the sentiment that you have been expressing all the while, that yes, indeed, this is, this, we are in a constitutional crisis. Parliament is not sitting. But with the outcome of today, does it contribute to the correction of that crisis that we find ourselves in? If you can unmute for me. Can you hear me, Alfred? Clearly. Yes. So I, I was saying, um, as the court proceedings were going on, I was thinking about our 275 members of parliament and how they would each individually feel about the outcome. Um, because <laughs> at the end of the day, most of what they do in the house, um, I think is based on a lot of understanding and a lot of compromise amongst them. Uh, sometimes even to the detriment of the law that they are fighting in court uh, right now. Um, sometimes, um, you know, the numbers are not there in parliament, but because they want the flow of the work of parliament, you know, nobody raises any objection. And so far as no objection is raised, um, the speaker allows the work of parliament to go on. Um, you know, the more we see, you know, this kind of legal arguments, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't go into even the merits or demerits of whatever happened in court today. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm just thinking that, you know, uh, the court getting into the space of parliament in, uh, in an era when you know, the numbers are very tight. Um, it, it, 
it creates you know a situation where for instance i mean if someone is aggrieved by the outcome i mean no i mean depending on how they read it then we might see a situation where they will say okay we are also going to apply the law in parliament and right. we are going to invoke invoke every single rule in the book right uh, then the crisis deepens then members of parliament will go into the house and you know nothing would happen then um we are still in the situation where, you know, where which group sits is still not resolved, and that is something that will be resolved politically. Right. But but also so that essentially uh, you come to the point where that concern about using the the courts or relying on the courts overly to address political matters, in your view, could could set a dangerous precedent. Um, yes, indeed, because like I was saying, if you want to use a law, always, I mean, the law is there. I think everybody has to obey the law in Parliament, the first one to obey the law because they make the laws and so on. Um, but I think there are times when, um, especially now, we are losing time every single day, right? And there's mm -hmm. serious government business that needs to be done. Um, Everybody can be ordered to obey the Supreme Court, um, the Speaker, the NDC caucus, and so on. Uh, then they go into Parliament, and then they boycott Parliament, or they refuse to do um, the work of Parliament. Decisions become very difficult to arrive at, and then it goes on and on and on. Or when they sit in the House, and then they start invoking all the rules that they can invoke. And uh, and then, uh, Alfred, one fundamental thing for me is, I mean, I had uh, arguments about representation and right. how the people of, I mean, all the people who queued and voted for mm. for the, the MPs are going to be denied representation, representation in parliament mm. for these uh, few weeks. But how, how about the people in SAL that, I mean, people have been asking, and some of us have said our parliament is not properly constituted, so long as there are some people who are not represented right from day one of the right. eighth parliament. How about those people? I mean, is there anybody who is speaking for them? Is the court, is the court aware of their case? Um, are they less important than Aguna Suedro and, uh, and all the other constituencies yeah, that we uh, have? Yes. Aguna West, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I think these are fundamental questions that we need to ask. Okay. But see, uh, people, and while we conclude on this, you talk about, uh, Council, you talk about how today's outcome further deepens the mistrust for the court and that is, is disconnected from the sentiments of people. But if you listen to the Chief Justice, she expressed those same sentiments that we're in a constitutional crisis. She, she is well aware of what's happening. That's not soothing for you? Yes. So, uh, you know, saying, what, what do I say? What I can say is that... Um, you know, I may not be in the head of the Chief Justice, so I'll hasten slowly. Uh, what I can say, and which I've said is that, well, for me, what transpired in court today did not show that we were, the court was uh, ready to do something to dissolve the constitutional crisis. That's not what I saw. That's not what I saw. There is even mediation. So a lot of stuff could have been done to dissolve the crisis, as I said, I, you know, when you look, you see law as a tool of social engineering. You see, we use law to bring society together. We use law to promote development, etc. So there are different ways that the court could have gone about this to be able to help dissolve the tension. As I said, it was simple for me. The court would simply have vacated the part of the order that says that the order suspending the speaker's ruling is to stay to the end. Mr. Kansi, as for that point, look, no matter what you say, 
that's one point that if you survey most lawyers, you get most lawyers agreeing right. that once the speaker was not heard, you couldn't have made that order that this, if you are suspending his order until you finish hearing the case. I right. think the Supreme Court just didn't want to eat humble pie. That one, it will be difficult. We'll never agree. No, I won't agree with the Supreme Court. You don't do that. So they should have eaten humble pie, rolled back that part of the order, and then, you know, as a party to George or, you see, at this strict thing, I have the power. I will rule how I want. That's the way I understood it. Well, the, the, the road or the path to November 11 uh, is one to watch, and the conversation has already started right from now to the next couple of weeks ahead of us. Lawyer Martin Pebble, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. And also to you, uh, Dr. Rashid Rahman, thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And Dr. Rashid Rahman, Executive Director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, also Martin Pebble is private legal practitioner one of the foremost human rights lawyers we have in this country. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, after this quick break, call it a campaign of questions and you will not be far from right because that's exactly what the two dominant presidential candidates, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya and John Dramani Mahama, are doing right now. They are trading questions at each other and the answers to those questions, obviously, will find out whether that would influence your decision to vote for either of them. Stay with us. We're back shortly. Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. Now, there's been trading of questions between John Mahama and Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. And let's just do a quick recall. John Mahama, the flag wearer of the NDC, was the first to shoot the questions, five questions at Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. Take a look. 170 questions himself. Indeed, he shouldn't answer 170 questions. He should answer only three questions. Three. Why is the exchange rate 17 CDs to the dollar? Question one. Exam. He should come and write. Why has Ghana's debt risen from 120 billion to 767 billion in eight years? Question two. He should come and answer. Question three. Why is inflation where it is? Why did it rise to 54%? Percent? Question four. Why did you borrow 42 billion CDs from the Bank of Ghana? Well, so those were the, were the questions that John Mahama posed to Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. And in the sequel to the 170 questions that he, he, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya posed to the late, that's uh, Pakusi Misatha. These five questions, as you see there, exchange rate, Ghana's debt risen to about 767 billion, inflation, and then borrowing over 42 billion. Why has well, he, he, that's Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya running away from the economy or talking about the economy and to digitalization. Well, guess what? Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya today also sent some questions over to John Dramani Mahama. And these were in fact over 50 questions uh, that, he, that he put out. First off, we'll take the first five. Can you name any broad-based social intervention policy that you implemented in Ghana as president? Why did you run advertisements against free SHS? If you think your economy, the economic management was so good, how come we experienced more than four years of doomso under your government? Why did the banking system almost collapse under your government? Why did you cancel teacher training allowances and a number of them? Right, about 50 questions Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya posed to John Dramani Mahama in response to the five questions that John Mahama posed to him. Well, Nanado Dankwe Kofado, the president, has also been talking because John Mahama himself had some questions for Nanado Dankwe Kofado as well, but this is what the president has been saying. I'm also a class here. Yes, I'm class of one. Class of one. I don't know what's our classroom. And your class, I'm a person about me, about the class, our classroom. Mohammed's class is only his one term tenure. And that is something I don't like Dr. Baumia to associate with. Dr. Baumia will continue another term after winning this post to be a part of Rollins, Kufo, and myself, who were handed two terms in office. Mohammed, they are no one term president, you know, they are no any about the pair of my 
So you might be wondering why Nanadu Akwekufa, the president, joining the, the question and the back and forth between John Mahama and Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. And I'll tell you why. In fact, don't say that I, you know, you're sticking to just one poll. If you look at a number of surveys and polls that have been done by both NCC, Global Info Analytics, Afrobarometer Survey, they all outline a number of issues that would influence the voter choices, right? And the economy is number one. So if you look at the two questions, two sets of questions that both are posing at each other, which one of them is centered on the economy? That's also finding its, its uh, reference point in here. Take a look at this. According to the Global Info Analytics, which of the following will have greater influence on the people who were surveyed, their decision on who to vote for, the current economic condition, 55% of the respondents said it was going to influence their decision on who to vote for, past performance of the parties came next, 40%, credibility of the candidate, 34%, 28% parties manifesto, 9% galamse, and then also other factors. If you look at the NCC survey, according to the respondents, the highest number of respondents who said that in terms of what will influence their decision on who to vote for, they're looking at the candidates and their promises, plus the candidates' track record and their experiences as well. All of those are going to influence their decision on who, who to vote for. But John Mahama had some questions for Nanado Dankwe Kufado, the president, as well. Take a look. Na 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 kufa do mi busa no one question. Sika ye teso no ewe he. Sika o ka se ye teso a e kom di ye no. Sa sika no ewe he. Well, the verdict, as Dennis will always say, is with you, the people. And the answers to these questions, some of them will find expressions in your daily lives. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you so much for staying with us here on your election command center. The conversation with this and many more continues. We're also live on 3FM 92.7. Join the New Day team, Sunrise team on TV3 and on 3FM 92.7. My name is Alfred Akonse. Have a good night.